Located at the center of most, if not all, galaxies are supermassive black holes with a mass of millions or billions of times greater than the Sun's mass. For example, in the center of our galaxy is Sagittarius A, whose mass amounts to about 4.5 million suns. Of the known black holes, the one with the smallest mass is only five times more massive than our star, but 100,000 times more compact. The diameter of some black holes is no more than the expanse of a large city, but the weight of such a munchkin is like 5,000 suns. The radius of others is comparable to the radius of the Earth, but their mass is six million times greater than that of our planet. It simply gets lost against the background of, say, the hole in the center of the Messier 60 galaxy, which has a mass of 4.7 billion suns. The class of ultramassive black holes begins at around this mass, the largest of which are made up of even as many as 4.5 billion suns. But even they seem to be cosmic infants. Currently, the largest known black hole is the Ton 618 Quasar, which has the mass of 66 billion times the mass of the Sun. It is located near the North Pole of the galaxy, in the constellation of Cain's Venatici, the hunting dogs. The Ton 618 Quasar is believed to have an accretion disk of hot gas orbiting the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy. The quasar is estimated to be 3.18 giga per sec or 10.37 billion light years away. The emission lines in the spectrum of Ton 618 are usually wide, which tells us that the gas in the accretion disk is moving at very high speed, about 7,000 kilometers per second. The galaxy, in the center of which the quasar is located, is not visible from Earth due to the brightness of the quasar itself. Its absolute stellar magnitude is 140 trillion times greater than that of the Sun. It is precisely because of this that the exact mass cannot be determined. What can't be said about this new challenger, which has the name Holm 15A. Holmberg 15A is a type CD supergiant elliptical galaxy that is located in the Abel 85 galaxy cluster in the constellation of Cetus, about 700 million light years from the Sun. The galaxy of type CD is a subclass of the giant elliptical galaxies of morphological class D. Such galaxies have large stellar halos and can be found near the centers of some large galaxy clusters. They are often considered as potentially the largest representative of galaxies in the universe. Holmberg 15A was discovered in 1937 by Eric Holmberg. The galaxy became famous after it was announced that it had the largest of all observed galactic cores sprawling about 15,000 light years in expanse. But then the discovery was refuted. Now Holm 15A is taking the lead again. The fact is that the Abel 85 cluster has its velocity dispersion in a dark halo of about 750 km per second, which can only be explained by the presence of a supermassive black hole with an immense mass of at least 170 billion solar masses. Although the halo of dark matter is not subject to this kind of scaling, but the evolution of a black hole and dark matter has nothing to do with baryonic matter. Notably, among known objects, this is one with the heaviest supermassive black holes. This classic case tells us that the main component of the galactic core is a supermassive black hole with a mass of about 40 billion solar masses and a radius of about 790 astronomical units. By comparison, Pluto is located at a distance of about 39.5 astronomical units away. However, according to the data, the gamma radiation from the object is so extensive that some researchers estimate Holm 15A at 310 billion solar masses. How is it possible? Let's try to figure out this galactic mystery. 
it became obvious from observation that the distribution of stellar orbits was shifting more and more towards tangential motion inside the core. However, the displacement is less than in that of other elliptical galaxies with cores. This tells us that in earlier time there was a merging of galaxies with black holes. Astronomers have detected that the observed magnitude of tangential anisotropy and the shape of the light profile are consistent with a formation scenario where Home 15A is remnant of the merger of two supergiant black holes. And now the masses of black holes in galaxies with cores, including Home 15A, are proportionally scaled inversely with the brightness of the star's central surface and the density of the mass, respectively. That is precisely why black hole Holm 15A has taken the position as one of the largest and hungriest supermassive black holes. The new estimate of its size is from 40 to 310 billion solar masses and its rate of accretion of matter is estimated from about 8,000 to 45,000 times more massive than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. If the black hole in our galaxy were to accumulate that much matter, it would have to mercilessly swallow two-thirds of all the stars in the Milky Way. Further research will reveal the secrets of this object, but no matter what, the Home 15A black hole is the heaviest among all that have been discovered thus far. Currently, it is believed that there are only three types of black holes, starting from the smallest to the largest. In front of us is the first view, the primordial or relic black holes. These are the smallest black holes whose formation took place in the early stages of the development of the universe. It is thought that clusters of matter, which appeared due to irregularities of the Big Bang, could collapse into the state of black holes while the rest of the matter expanded. A black hole is not always something that is very large and heavy. Researchers suspect that the size of some primordial black holes may be significantly smaller than the size of a proton. The second view. These are stellar mass black holes. They originate in the aftermath of the life cycle of massive stars. Make note that the black holes are formed only from stars with a mass that exceeds the mass of the Sun by 20 to 40 times. Another alternative for the formation of a stellar mass black hole is gas accretion. Accretion is the accumulation of matter from the surrounding space into a cosmic body. Gas falls into a neutron star until the mass of the latter exceeds the maximum possible mass for neutron stars. In such an instance, the neutron star will collapse into a low-mass black hole. And finally, the third type, supermassive black holes. It is assumed that these objects are located in the centers of galaxies. Their mass can be up to 10 to 9th power the mass of the Sun. Among them is a massive hole in the center of the Milky Way with a weight of 4 million solar masses. It is believed to have formed from a giant gas cloud that compressed into dark matter or, alternatively, is part of the first generation of heavy stars that collapsed into primordial black holes and then merged into one supermassive black hole. There also exists a hypothesis according to which supermassive black holes are located in the center of quasars. The understudied and most distant of those cosmic objects that can be observed from the Earth. Quasars are galactic nuclei and have a black hole in their center. Quasars are incredibly luminous and small in size and they can be observed at a distance of 10 billion light years. These objects emit a tremendous amount of energy in all of the regions of the electromagnetic spectrum and especially in the infrared region. It is precisely this type of massive black hole that interests us. However, as a rule, a commonly accepted theory of the formation of black holes of this sort of mass, similar to that in the center of galaxy CAD 947, does not yet exist.
galaxy CID 947 is a most ordinary galaxy. The total mass of its stars is just 45 billion times greater than that of our Sun. For comparison, this figure for the Milky Way, which is considered a fairly small spiral galaxy, is 64 billion solar masses. But at the same time, the mass of the supermassive black hole at its center turned out to be inordinately large. According to the calculations, its mass exceeds that of the Sun by almost 7 billion times, which makes this object one of the largest black holes in the early universe, and makes it the leader in the weight category of galaxies of this size. This sort of a finding completely contradicts the well-established theories about the growth of black holes in the centers of galaxies, which postulate that the stellar megapolises and the heavyweights living in their centers grow approximately the same rate and that their masses always maintain the same ratio of 1 to 500. It is possible, but not for long. In fact, for much shorter than we think, since this sort of hibernation carries risks, even if people go into it for several months and not years. The consequences may not be reversible, and from what was a strong team, all that will remain will be exhausted and depressed travelers. Therefore, we're back to the old scenario. So having left the Earth behind, the 98 space travelers will give birth to children, and they to grandchildren, even during the lifetime of the first generation. So judging by the calculations, the maximum population on the Ark could reach 500 people. And this means that the colonists will have to provide themselves with food on their own. In other words, grow it directly on board the ship. But how much food do they need? After all, the size of the ship depends on this and therefore the energy required to move it. These calculations require taking not only the size of the crew into account, but also the average age of the spaceship's inhabitants, their height, weight and level of physical activity, in order to understand how many calories they will each need annually. If the ship is constructed in the form of a rotating cylinder, so that the centrifugal force provides artificial gravity, then the height of the agricultural compartment should be 320 meters with a radius of 224 meters. Add to this the crew's quarters, the common areas such as a dining room, a gym or a medical unit, the flight control rooms, the power generators and the engines, and the size of the spaceship will approximately double in size. The space arc will be approximately 650 meters long and 450 meters in diameter. Almost half a million liters of portable water will be required. But we have circulation that runs around the ship, so everything works. Keep in mind that our flight is very long. And yes, most likely we personally will not be able to reach our star with the speed indicated in the task. More precisely, it will be possible to get there, but it will take about 500 years. Of course, it is possible that fewer psychological problems will arise for the subsequent generations who will have been born on the ship. Inside, there is an entire world. There are 24 habitats, each with its own unique flora, fauna and weather conditions. Hundreds of people will have been born and died during the journey. Now there are about 2,000 inhabitants. For them, the ship has been their home all their lives. But very soon, this will change. The ship has begun to decelerate and it will take a mere 10 years to reach the destination. Ahead is a new world, a new planet, a new hope for mankind. And perhaps, during the time while the colonists were on their way, the planet became habitable. Who knows? Who knows?
As you can see, we had to disregard some things and violate a lot of others. Interstellar journeys are still a fantasy for us. But what kind of fantasy doesn't become reality after a while? At some point, every single one of you has contemplated the thought, what is infinity anyhow? How can you understand it? How can you imagine it? How can you wrap your mind around it? And how can you picture an endless sequence of numbers? A constant which never ends. A number that includes the phone numbers of all your acquaintances, the dates of birth of all the people on the planet their credit card numbers, the designations of all known stars, and even the date of your dentist appointment. All of this massive series of numbers is contained in an amazing mathematical constant, the number pi. And despite the fact that it has been known since ancient times, to this day, Pi stimulates the minds not only of scientists, but also of ordinary people. Those who first calculated the number Pi can be considered prehistoric people, who, when weaving baskets, noticed that in order to get the desired diameter, it was necessary to use a reed three times as long as the diameter. This fact was recorded on tablets made of baked clay that were found in Mesopotamia. Examples of accurate and not entirely accurate calculations of the number pi can be found in the works of Egyptian, Babylonian, Indian, Chinese and ancient Greek geometers. So what is this mysterious number pi anyway? It is a mathematical constant that expresses the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Many ancient scientists, including Archimedes, try to calculate pi each time by filling a circle with polygons that had an enormous number of sides, so they would more tightly fit within the area of the circle. Archimedes used a 96 gun, Chinese mathematicians fit in a 192 gun, then a 3072 gun, and finally they managed to fit a polygon with a 24,576 sides into a circle. This is why many mathematicians contend that a circle is a figure with an infinite number of angles. Up until the 15th century, only nine decimal places were known. Isaac Newton calculated the number pi to 16 digits. As recently as the 19th century, it was calculated out of 707 decimal places. But with the advent of computers, this process has accelerated significantly. And now, science has already identified about 50 trillion decimal places. Pi is irrational. Its decimal representation never comes to an end, and it is not periodic. Consequently, based upon the formula that the circumference of a circle is equal to pi times its diameter, the circle doesn't come to a close, since there is no finite number. This fact can also be closely related to the spiral characteristics in our lives. After all, even the orbit of our Earth is not at all a circle. It moves in a spiral, 
relative to the center of the universe and space-time. A logical question arises. How many numbers do you need to know in order to make a given calculation? Let's round pi up to the 15th digit. And as an example, let's take the farthest spacecraft from the Earth, Voyager 1, which is located at a distance of about 20 billion kilometers. Imagine a circle with a radius this size, in other words, a diameter of 40 billion kilometers, for which we want to calculate its circumference using formula 2 pi r. It turns out to be a little more than 125 billion kilometers. We don't need to put emphasis on the exact circumference, we are interested in the error of the measurement. So it turns out that the circumference using the constant rounded up to 15 digits is calculated with an error of less than 4 centimeters. Think about that. We have a circumference of 125 billion kilometers and the margin of error is less than the length of your little finger. We can study the problem using the example of the Earth. The diameter at the equator is 12,756 kilometers. The circumference of the equator is 40,075 kilometers, which is the distance you'd have to cover if you want to travel around the world, not taking into account mountains, valleys and obstacles like buildings, parking lots, ocean waves, etc. How wrong is your odometer when using a rounded off value of pi? Its error is about the size of a molecule. Naturally, there are different kinds of molecules which do differ in size, but you get the idea. The size of the error is about 10,000 times less than the thickness of a strand of hair. Now, let's take the largest possible object, the visible universe. Its radius is approximately 46 billion light years. How many decimal places of pi do you need to use to calculate the circumference of the universe with an error of no more than the diameter of a hydrogen atom, the smallest atom? You need 39 places following the decimal. If you think about how huge the universe is, well, and truly larger than we could ever comprehend, and such a tiny atom of hydrogen, you will then understand that a really accurate calculation doesn't require very many decimal places of pi. There is an abundance of surprising facts about this constant. Stanislav Ulam, a Polish-American mathematician, in 1965 wrote the numbers of pi out on graph paper. He put the three in the center and moving in a counterclockwise spiral wrote down the numbers after the decimal point. In addition, he drew circles around all the prime numbers. He was both surprised and aghast when he noticed that the circles were organized in straight lines. Then, using a special algorithm, the mathematician made a color picture based on this drawing, which is called the Ulam spiral. Seeing that pi correlates a curved object, a circle, with a straight object, the diameter, we can find it in all sorts of places. Some find the number pi in riverbeds, the length of a river, with all of its meandering bands in relation to the straight line between its source and its delta, according to calculations, is on average pi. Models for virtually all wave-related phenomena will involve the number pi. Let's take light and sound, for example. Pi determines what colors are visible in the spectrum of a rainbow and how the note C should sound. The number pi is also observed in the process of the cells in apples acquiring a spherical form and in the brightness of the light output of a supernova. Well, perhaps the code of the universe is encrypted in this number.
as a representative of his own civilization, has always been interested in the unknown and unexplored. This desire has been the driving force behind countless achievements and discoveries, leading to an era when establishing contact with alien civilizations no longer seems like a fantasy. The reasons for this can be varied and far-reaching. First is our inherent need for communication and connection. Turning to extraterrestrial life is an extension of our desire to realize that we are not alone in the vastness of the universe. Second, the discovery of other civilizations can give us insight into different forms of socio-cultural and technological entities. It may also contribute to progress that will lead us to numerous technological advances in astronomy, physics and other sciences in other sciences. The prospect of meeting new civilizations pushes us to develop innovative ways to search and communicate over cosmic distances. The realization that we live in the universe with other forms of intelligent life may encourage us to take a more universal view of the world, freeing us from the idea that we are alone in the universe. Speaking of civilizations, it is impossible not to mention the explanation of Soviet Russian expert in the field of experimental and theoretical astrophysics, Nikolai Kardashev, who in 1964 proposed an innovative scale of civilization known today as the Kardashev scale. This scale was originally developed as a method of measuring the level of technological development of a civilization, in particular, the ability of a civilization to use and manage energy. The Kardashev scale includes three types of civilizations, but today this scale has expanded and types of civilizations are now six. We propose to briefly consider these types and then discuss how realistic it is to meet representatives of at least one of them in the solar system our galaxy and throughout the universe. So, civilization of the first type, often called planetary civilization, is able to use all the resources available on its home planet, control weather, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and other natural phenomena. It can also utilize some of the energy the planet receives from its star. Very often, this stage of development becomes a trap for a civilization as it enters a state of self-sufficiency, directing resources to virtual development instead of further expansion. Many civilizations of this type cease to exist due to catastrophic changes in the native star, turning it into a new or supernova star, which makes this type doomed. And yet humanity is not yet a type one civilization. We are at about the level we are only about 30% short of development. This suggests that we consume only 0.17% of the planet's total energy potential. We are expected to reach level one in about 1200 years, depending on how fast our technology advances. But there is a high probability that civilizations that have not yet reached level one will self-destruct in the process of transitioning to the new level of development and one must admit that humanity is doing a great job. A type I, I civilization, also known as a stellar civilization, takes it a step further by harnessing not only the energy of its home planet, but the entire energy of its star. Hypothetically, this could be accomplished using technology such as a Dyson Sphere, a massive structure capable of encompassing a star and capturing most of its energy. Such a sphere would be able to control the orbits of all planets in the solar system, collect asteroids and comets in its spare time. But its main purpose is to consume the star's energy in maximum quantities. Most likely, this type of civilization has developed to such an extent that there is already a great chance to carry out interstellar travel and colonize planets in other star systems. Civilizations of the second type have survived their youth, have overcome turbulent times, and the chances of continuing their development increase dramatically at this point. A civilization of the third type 
or galactic civilization of the third type, or galactic civilization further expands its energy control. Such a civilization can harness the energy of an entire galaxy, including not just one star, but hundreds of billions of stars. Such a civilization will encompass its home galaxy, colonizing and controlling numerous star systems. It would be able to harness the energy of all the stars in the galactic cluster. Such a civilization will also use planets and their satellites as building blocks. It can move planets with their inhabitants from one star system to another, merge stars, absorb the energy of supernovae, and even create stars on its own. The galaxy becomes a huge platform for the life of the third type of civilization. Such civilizations must exist for at least several million years. To reach such a level of development requires the unification of many species of intelligent beings into a single whole as described by many science fiction writers. But the fourth type of civilization is able to use a huge amount of available energy of galactic superscalings. Such a supergalactic civilization has everything it needs to travel across the universe. The society of superbeings will be capable of projects of forbidden possibilities, such as manipulation of space-time, prevention of entropy, which will allow to achieve real immortality in the broadest sense. On the one hand, such a civilization is indestructible. But on the other hand, it is utopian. A civilization of the fifth type, it is assumed, will be able to access all available energy of the universe and even go beyond it, embracing countless parallel worlds and learning to manipulate the very structure of reality changing some aspects of the physics of the physics of the physics of the universe. And finally, a civilization of the sixth type. It will be able to boldly harness the energies of multiple universes, alter their physics, and even prevent heat death to exist forever. Such a civilization exists outside of time and space and is even capable of creating other universes and destroying them just as easily. This is similar to the concept of a deity where God could be one representative of a type 6 civilization. This description of civilizations is followed by a natural question. Well, where are they all? Why don't we observe any traces of intelligent extraterrestrial life, such as probes, spaceships, or radio signals? This was the same question posed by physicist Enrico Fermi. His reflections on the silence of the universe formed the basis of Fermi's paradox. The lack of visible traces of activity of alien civilizations that should have spread throughout the universe over billions of years of its development. Humanity has been searching for extraterrestrial intelligence for decades. Despite the technological leap and boundless optimism, we have yet to find a single living green man. But why? For one thing, the universe is incomprehensibly vast. It is estimated to be about 93 billion light years in diameter, with at least 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies may contain millions to trillions of stars. Looking for civilizations in this cosmos is like looking for one particular grain of sand on the world's largest beach even if the grain of sand has a navigation system. Second, time is another serious opponent in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Civilizations could have arisen and died millions of years before us, or they could have failed to appear millions of years after we disappeared. Our existence may simply not coincide with the existence of other civilizations on the cosmic timescale, making contact with them highly unlikely. Third, communication with other civilizations is burdened by vast cosmic distances. Any signal we transmit or receive can take hundreds, thousands, or even millions of years to reach its destination. By the time the signals reach us or them, 
civilizations may have disappeared or evolved into forms beyond our comprehension. Fourth, they may not communicate in ways we can detect. Civilizations far beyond our level of development may be communicating using technologies undetectable by our current methods or on frequencies we have yet to explore. At this point, our level of communication is nothing more than Morse code. Moreover, they may deliberately conceal their existence, and they prefer not to interfere with life on Earth, but only to watch everything that happens, which is another horror movie. Finally, the Great Filter Theory suggests that there is a good chance of civilization extinction before they reach interstellar capabilities. This could happen either by their own catastrophes such as nuclear wars or by natural disasters due to, for example, asteroid impacts. If this is the case, it means that we may have no counterpart in the cosmos and that we have yet to encounter our own great filter. How would we, even theoretically, be able to recognize or detect such an advanced civilization? After all, their technology if such a technology exists, is something that our current theories can hardly describe, and our instruments would certainly not be able to detect. Its possibilities would contradict the scientific laws we know. For example, the idea of a Type 6 civilization, while attractive, presents us with many problems, technological, scientific, philosophical, and, of course, observational. The logic of detection definition, and even existence itself becomes blurred at this scale. Yes, finding another intelligent civilization in the universe is an extremely difficult task. But despite all these obstacles, humanity continues to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, fueled at least by curiosity. For now, the universe seems silent. But as technology advances and the search continues, we may someday find answers to our questions. Traveling through uncharted spaces, be it the dark depths of the oceans or the vastness of space, is astonishing. But can the principles that drive submarines in the crushing depths of Earth's oceans also drive them among the stars? That's the question at the heart of our study today. By delving into the complex mechanics of submarines and spaceships, we'll unravel the similarities and differences that determine how they work. Would a submarine work like a spaceship? An exploration that will take us beyond the horizon, where the depths of our oceans reflect the infinity of space, inviting us to reflect on the limits of human innovation and the universal principles that guide our journey through the unknown. So both submarines and spacecraft share a number of common features in design, functionality and mission objectives, mainly due to the hostile, inaccessible and remote nature of their habitat. Both ships are examples of sophisticated engineering designed to sustain human life in environments that are inherently inhospitable to humans. And we begin with life support, systems responsible for oxygen supply, carbon dioxide removal, temperature regulation, humidity and sweep bars. Given the closed environment of both ships, maintaining a habitable atmosphere is critical to crew survival. The methods for obtaining oxygen in places so remote differ because of the unique challenges of working in water or space. You don't have to fill your cabin with phytoplankton to get oxygen, but you can use an oxygen generation system or OGs. Typically, OGSS function by electrolyzing water to separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. The resulting oxygen is then collected and supplied to the crew for breathing. This method provides a self-sustaining source of oxygen for long underwater missions. Submarines may also use compressed oxygen tanks as a backup or emergency oxygen source that can be used in the event of failure of other systems. As a last resort, Submarines may be equipped with emergency chemical oxygen generators. These devices produce oxygen through a chemical reaction, usually involving the decomposition of a solid chemical compound to produce oxygen gas. Like submarines, spacecraft often use the same electrolysis of water from supplies or wastewater to produce oxygen. The water is split into hydrogen and oxygen, which is then released into the spacecraft's atmosphere for breathing. Some spacecraft, such as Apollo, used solid fuel cells to generate electricity and simultaneously produce oxygen as a byproduct. In these fuel cells, hydrogen reacts with oxygen to produce electricity and water, and the excess oxygen is released into the cabin air. In terms of structural strength, 
submarines must withstand the high pressures of the deep sea environment, while spacecraft must withstand the internal pressures necessary to sustain human life in the vacuum of space. Therefore, both use strong, durable materials and engineering structures that can withstand such pressure differentials. Some modern submarines use titanium alloys in critical areas because of their superior strength to weight ratio and exceptional corrosion resistance. Aluminium alloys can be used in non-structural components and for buoyancy tanks because of their lightness and saltwater resistance. As in submarines, spacecraft can also use titanium alloys for individual components, especially in areas where strength, corrosion resistance and weight are important. In addition, titanium's ability to withstand extreme temperature extremes makes it suitable for use in spacecraft thermal management systems. In addition to metals, modern composite materials, such as carbon fiber reinforced polymers, are used in spacecraft for individual structural elements. These materials offer a high strength to weight ratio as well as thermal stability. But there are also differences. Submarines primarily require materials that can withstand the high pressures associated with deep sea operations. In contrast, spacecraft must withstand the extreme temperature differences in space, as well as the dynamic stresses of launch and spacewalking. Submarines often consider the magnetic signature of metals because of its effect on stealth. Therefore, the selection of materials takes into account the reduction of magnetic detection. In contrast, this consideration is not yet as relevant in spacecraft design. As we know, navigation in the deep sea and space requires high accuracy. Both types of vessels use sophisticated navigation systems to determine their position and course. In addition, given the remote nature of their missions, they rely on advanced communications technology to maintain contact with command centers. Submarines often use inertial navigation systems, which track motion from a known starting point using gyroscopes and accelerometers. This system is very useful for submarines operating in deep water where GPS signals cannot penetrate. Like submarines, Spacecraft also use inertial navigation systems to determine their motion. Given the lack of atmospheric or oceanic drag in space, these systems can be highly accurate over long periods of time. Submarines can use GPS signals to update or calibrate their navigation systems, ensuring accuracy over long distances. These periodic updates help correct any drift that accumulates in the inertial navigation system. Interestingly, spacecraft in low Earth orbit can also sometimes use the Global Positioning System for precise positioning similar to land users and submarines when they are near the surface. But there are differences, of course. Submarines use sonar for underwater navigation and object detection. Active sonar emits sound pulses pings that reflect off objects and then return to the submarine, determining distance and direction to obstacles or the seabed. Passive sonar listens for sounds emitted by other vessels or aggressive killer whales to help stealthy navigation. But for spacecraft, sonar is useless. With it, it will not fly far away or will fly away only irretrievably. They have to orientate themselves by the stars and other celestial bodies. Star tracking systems on spacecraft are used to maintain orientation and navigation. This method is invaluable for deep space missions where Earth-based systems make it impossible to navigate. There are also ground stations that track spacecraft using radar and radio telescopes. These structures can calculate the position and velocity of a spacecraft by measuring the so-called Doppler shift of radio signals sent and received by the spacecraft. For communications, submarines use very low frequencies, especially for receiving messages when submerged at shallow depths. To transmit messages, submarines can install floating antennas near the surface, allowing them to use higher frequency bands while also remaining submerged. Underwater communication systems also include acoustic methods, which use sound waves to transmit information. This method is slow and has a limited range suitable mainly for communication between submarines, nearby ships, and aquatic humanoids. Spacecraft, on the other hand, use mostly radio waves to communicate with Earth. The vast distances involved require highly sensitive receivers and powerful transmitters, both on spacecraft and in ground stations. Space agencies maintain networks of large antenna arrays. These easy-to-manufacture wafers are especially needed to communicate with missions beyond Earth orbit. Spacecraft in lower orbit or on the surface of planets, particularly Mars, can use repeater satellites to communicate with Earth. Submarines and spacecraft operate in very different environments and therefore use different types of propulsion systems to meet their unique needs and missions. Cooling methods for these engines also vary depending on the specific type of engine and the requirements of the operating environment. Conventional submarines are equipped with diesel-electric propulsion systems. These systems consist of diesel engines and it is these engines that drive the generators to charge the batteries, which in turn power the electric motors for propulsion. 
This setup allows submarines to move silently underwater using battery power without having to surface frequently to recharge. Nuclear submarines use nuclear reactors to generate steam that drives turbines connected to electrical generators. The generated electricity powers the propulsion motors or directly drives the propellers. Nuclear propulsion provides greater range and operational endurance than diesel-electric systems. Submarine propulsion systems, especially those with internal combustion components such as diesel engines or generators, often use direct seawater cooling. The seawater is circulated through heat exchangers, absorbing the heat generated by the engine components and then discharged back into the sea. This cooling method is effective in dissipating excess heat and maintaining optimum engine temperature. Great technology that won't even get us to the moon. That's why most spacecraft use chemical propulsion systems like liquid rocket engines. These engines burn liquid or solid propellants to create thrust for orbital maneuvers or course correction. Some spacecraft use a combination of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen as propellants for high-performance engines. Ion or Hall effect propulsion engines are used on some spacecraft for propulsion especially for long-duration mission missions requiring low thrust but high efficiency. These electric propulsion systems ionize fuel gases and accelerate the resulting ions to create thrust. In general, for both submarines and spacecraft, engine efficiency and cooling efficiency are prioritized to ensure optimal performance and mission success. But as we have seen here, different propulsion technologies and cooling methods are used to meet their operational requirements. Of course, crews of both submarines and spacecraft have to face long periods of isolation and confinement. The psychological impact of long missions is a problem in both realms, requiring careful selection and training of crew members. Initially, by the way, astronauts wanted to be selected specifically from submariners because they already had experience in extreme conditions and confined spaces, which was similar to the conditions of spaceflight. In addition, submariners are already accustomed to working in a team and to fulfill complex tasks in conditions of limited time and space. To summarize our research into the question of whether a submarine can perform the role of a spaceship, we can say that these marvels of engineering are not interchangeable. It is amazing, but the submarine, Lord of the Ocean Depths, and the spaceship, Traveler of the Void of the Universe, are wonderfully adapted to their unique conditions. Differences in operational areas from the density of water to the emptiness of space dictate vast differences in design, propulsion and life support systems. The pressures underwater contrast sharply with the vacuum of space, leading to fundamentally different challenges in structural integrity and environmental control critical to human survival. Thus, while the idea of a vessel capable of traveling both the depths of the ocean and into space is exciting, the practicalities of engineering, physics and safety make it a science fiction concept. Nevertheless, our journey into the unknown, whether beneath the waves or among the stars, continues to push the boundaries of technology and ingenuity. The image of UFOs and aliens is not uncommon in science fiction. But what about the reality? What are the chances of people encountering this phenomenon? In this issue, we will try not to be biased and answer different questions and loud statements from those who have seen something and know something. And at the end, I will tell in my story of meeting with UFOs. And we will begin, perhaps, with the famous case, which occurred on July 4, 1947, in the state of New Mexico. Farmer William Mack Brazell went to check on a flock of sheep after a severe thunderstorm. At the same time, on the hillside, in the desert, the farmers saw strange debris of a mysterious object, by description similar to a flying saucer. Moreover, there were transparent spheres with humanoid figures inside. The man reported the discovery to the sheriff. The military also arrived at the site of the falling object. The story received great publicity, and the news was discussed even on the air of a local radio station. However, it was later reported that the vine was a media sonde, but most did not agree. About this case was not remembered for 30 years. Until in the late 1970s, the head of the intelligence department, Jesse Marcel, did not admit in an interview that the version of the weather balloon, falsification, and that the military really observed mysterious artifacts like non-creeping foil, strange symbols, and lightweight but super strong elements. 
It's a story that's been discussed in the press for two decades. And it all ended with the fact that in 1994, published the official conclusion of a new investigation. It said, crashed object, classified military program to monitor nuclear tests. Well, we never found out the truth. But this story has one strange coincidence, namely the year of the event. The fact is that in the 1950s was created V's, nine or Avrocar flying vehicle that looks like a flying saucer, and it was not a classified technology. According to the documents, engineers tried to achieve vertical landing and vertical takeoff of the craft using jet engines. Also, experts believed that their device as a whole could reach speeds of up to 5,000 km rise to a height of up to 30 chem and have a maximum range of about 1900 chem. But in reality, experts failed to raise the ship only a few meters and its speed was no more than 56 chem h. Because of the central jet engine, the flying machine worked loudly and at the same time it exposed the pilot to high temperatures. Officially, the project was shut down. But what if it wasn't? Just imagine what the engineers could have achieved in 70 years. Meanwhile, UFOS continued to appear to both casual eyewitnesses and pilots. So in May 1957, fighter pilot Milton Torres, in the quiet English countryside, was suddenly ordered to take to the air and shoot down an unidentified flying object. The pilot pursued the object, which at times appeared to be stationary and then began to approach at a speed of about 2,000 chem. According to the pilot, the UFO did not follow classical Newtonian mechanics. It made a right turn, almost on the spot. But when the pilot fixed the object and prepared to fire, it disappeared from the radar screens. For the record, radar can't see ball lightning. This strange encounter was one of the few that occurred during the Cold War. One of the most famous UFO sighting projects is the so-called Blue Book. This project attempted to organize numerous eyewitness sightings into one common archive. The realization of the project began in 1947. And by 1947, all activities were curtailed. By the time it was closed, more than 12,000 different kinds of evidence about the existence of extraterrestrial life, UFOs, and aliens had been collected most of which were just fabrications and falsifications of eyewitnesses. But there were some events that are still unexplained to this day. Things were different in the Soviet Union. Special services actively studied any reports of contacts with extraterrestrials. And among ordinary people, there were many activists who paid attention to this problem at will. In the 90s, interest in UFOs disappeared and along with its disappearance stopped in research. Although archives about these phenomena, cases and developments still exist. And now in our time, and more precisely in 2022, NASA reported that it will be engaged in its own study of UFOs from a scientific point of view, or as they are now called, unexplained anomalous phenomena or phenomena and this is not for nothing. The fact is that talk of suspicious objects in the sky above different countries became more frequent after the US shot down the fourth such object, including in Alaska, saying that they do not exclude its extraterrestrial origin. And as always, most of the material is classified. During the year about strange objects in the sky, said Uruguay, Chile, India, China, Canada, European countries, and especially countries where there are military conflicts, which also can't be a coincidence, then what are they? Classified developments of large private corporations, or actually the intervention of alien travelers. In favor of the latter was David Grush, former intelligence officer who also argued that the authorities have not only the wreckage of alien spacecraft, but also the remains of aliens. He is absolutely certain that the authorities for decades may have been hiding top 
secret programs to detect and study extraterrestrial life forms and their technology. According to him, there are partially intact aircraft of alien origin, which either successfully landed or crashed and crashed. Moreover, he was able to obtain and begin studying UFO fragments as part of the government's classified alien craft search program. In addition to David Grush, there were two other witnesses at the Congressional Committee hearing, also Pentagon employees, who spoke in similar terms. What's not clear is if this is top secret information, why is it available to everyone? Meanwhile, Harry Nolan, a professor of immunology, said that aliens have visited Earth and are still here. In his opinion, the effect on Earthlings' aliens produced the same effect as the Spanish galleons on the Native Americans. They just cannot realize. In addition, footage of two recently declassified UFO sightings was shown. A video made in the Middle East in 2022 and remains unexplored. Another footage from South Asia, which was made this year and similarly awaits peer review. However, the reality may be more prosaic. After the incident with the Chinese balloon, they began to look more closely at the sky, and just in case to shoot down in general all objects falling in the field of view. News of the shot down in the sky. Mysterious objects caused a wave of activity among amateur ufologists, and predicts that in the near future reports of UFOs will increase even more. And it's true. The U.S. intelligence community said that, as of August 2022, intelligence agencies have received 510 reports of unidentified flying objects to illustrate between now and March 5, 2021. There were only 344 reports of such objects in a total of 17 years of sightings. A particularly memorable case from those times occurred in Belgium back in 1990. On the night of March 30th through March 30th through March 31st, that night unknown objects were tracked on radar and were seen by a total of 13,000 IE witnesses, 2,600 of whom filed written statements detailing what they saw. Yes, it was impossible to hide it and pointless. Therefore, after the incident, the Belgian Air Force issued a detailed report on the events of that night at around 23. Zero, on March 30, the head of the center received a report that three unusual lights were seen moving towards the city. The lights were reportedly brighter than stars, changed their colors between red, green, and yellow, and appeared to be placed at the vertices of an equilateral triangle with a similarly luminous element at its center. After about 10 minutes, a second group of lights was found moving in the direction of the first triangle. After half an hour, it was possible to observe the phenomenon on radar. At this time, the second group of lights, through some random maneuvers, also turned into a small triangle. The center gave the order to send two F-16 warplanes in secrecy. Throughout this time, the phenomenon was still clearly visible from the ground. Witnesses described a whole formation of lights maintaining their position relative to each other while they moved slowly across the sky. Over the next hour, the two F-16s attempted to lock onto the target nine times. On three occasions, they managed to get its coordinates from the radar for a few seconds but each time the position and speed of the target changed so rapidly that the lock was dropped. During the first radar focus, the target accelerated from 240 chem H to more than 1770 chem, while changing altitude from 2700 M to 1500 M, then to 3000, 300 M to 50 M, and then descended almost to ground level. The first descent from more than 900 M was accomplished in less than Similar maneuvers were observed during both subsequent radar focuses. In neither case did the pilots have visual contact with the target. Moreover, despite the tremendous speed, there was no hint of the sonic boom that would inevitably occur when breaking the sound barrier. 
in addition, according to pilot Stack Robert, such a sudden change in acceleration and deceleration and deceleration would have been fatal to one or more of the human pilots flying the object. During this time, witnesses on the ground confirmed by numerous reports that the smaller triangle they had seen had completely disappeared from view, while the larger triangle was moving upwards very quickly as the F-16 flew past. After that, the plane's radars and those at the control center completely lost contact. It is actually hard to believe, but it was this object that I and a few other people observed in 2007, only it was in Russia, in a small town. The object was quite massive, about 30 meters, but at the same time, absolutely silent, halted, and instantly could move in a matter of seconds. It looked exactly as it was described by eyewitnesses in Belgium. Honestly, it was hard to believe that this unidentified object was human, made. Most likely, you too have seen something strange in the sky. Share your story. Yes, people love interesting mysteries. Something mystical, unexplained, and UFOs are on that list. But there are nuances, and the increased interest in the unexplained has a downside. It can reinforce the erroneous idea that UFOs must be alien spaceships serving as a cover for government organizations and their manipulations, especially if we take into account the events of recent years. In favor of this recall, the unique secret and unclassified projects that existed back in 1950s. Just imagine more than 70 years have passed and engineers could achieve amazing achievements in a completely new field that we have no idea about the technology that makes silent vehicles of all shapes and sizes fly. And it seems that these technologies will be under secret for a long time because their introduction into our lives threatens to affect many interests, from national security to the world economy. But who knows? Maybe we are wrong and we are being watched for a long time. We just need to understand who or what exactly. In any case, the truth is somewhere near. When we speak of the spatial extent of the universe, it is necessary to separate two concepts. The first is the size of the observable portion of the universe or the span of the current horizon. The name speaks for itself. It is the direct equivalent of the horizon as we define it on Earth, the imaginary border of the visible part of the Earth. And in this case, the universe. We don't see whatever lies beyond this border. That's not necessarily because there is nothing there. Just as in the case of the Earth's horizon, we don't see what is beyond, because the light from there hasn't reached us. When it comes to the Earth's horizon, it doesn't reach us because the Earth's surface obstructs it. In the case of the cosmological horizon, the light from the photons simply hadn't had enough time to reach us. The unique thing about observing distant objects in space is that the light registered from these objects today has traveled throughout the universe for a long time and in actual fact was emitted an extremely long time ago. Thus, objects located at cosmologically large distances are objects that have existed since the beginning of time and emitted the light that we register very, very early on. The very earliest signal of which we are aware and have studied well is the extraordinary cosmic microwave background radiation, which appeared in the era of hydrogen formation, when there were no galaxies or stars. At that distant time, the universe was a billion times denser, 
and photons were a thousand times hotter than they are today. As these photons spread throughout the universe, it was expanding. By reviewing microwave research, information can be obtained about the characteristics of the expansion of the universe, its composition and internal structure. The most distant region that is possible to see and distinguish is the last scattering surface. It is from there that the cosmic microwave background photons emanate. This is the so-called surface of the last scattering. Beyond this region is what is not yet subject to study by our devices. We cannot see the area that is located beyond the surface of the last scattering because it is opaque. After all, it is light that allows us to see distant objects and judge their properties by one means or another. Regardless of the fact that it is impossible to see what is happening beyond the last scattering surface, researchers are able to form an opinion about the expanse beyond it. To do this, they observe what effect it has on existing astrophysical objects. More than that, according to the latest data, galaxies are moving away from each other at an accelerated pace. And the further away the galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. This means that at some point the speed of the separating galaxies will exceed the speed of light and we will no longer see them. These objects will go beyond the horizon but will not disappear. This fact implies that perhaps out there, beyond the observable universe, lies an additional vast expanse that is hidden from us by the barrier of the speed of light. The point being that CMB maps made with telescopes such as those of NASA's WMAP and the ESA's Planck showed on a vast scale a mystifying lack of perturbations. This jaunty little word means the departure of a celestial body from an orbit because of the influences of forces other than the gravitational attraction of the center of mass of the system, such as other celestial bodies or environmental resistance. In order to find out if these missing perturbations could be caused by a multiply-connected universe, scientists made many computer simulations of what the cosmic microwave background radiation would look like if the universe had the form of a giant three-dimensional donut, where it is connected to itself in all three dimensions. The properties of the observed fluctuations such as the deviation from the mean value of a random magnitude characterizing a system of a large number of chaotically interacting particles of the cosmic microwave background radiation show insufficient power on a scale exceeding the size of the universe. This lack of power means that fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation are not present on such scales and that our universe is multiply connected and finite. In other words, it looks like the cosmic microwave background is missing signals which must be present if the universe were truly infinite. One explanation for this suggests that the topology of the universe is curved in such a way that it connects back to itself like a donut or a bagel of intergalactic dimensions. Just as you can roll a sheet of paper into a tube without changing its parallel properties, the universe can be donut-shaped while remaining flat. This is exactly what the researchers have found out with the aid of simulations of the cosmic microwave background. It turns out that compared to the standard cosmological model, which is considered infinite, we found a much better matching observation of the fluctuations. Such a universe must have an end, and the entirety of the vast expanse is possibly no more than four times larger than the boundaries of the universe that is observable by man and its size is 47 billion light-years in diameter. The universe can be self-contained in three dimensions and have the shape of a three-dimensional donut. Models of the finite universe may be intimidating to some people, but you will not perceive these boundaries. For all practical purposes, you simply live in an infinite universe, despite it having finite dimensions. But even if you don't necessarily end up finding yourself at the edge of this finite universe, would you be able to circumnavigate it and return to where you started? In theory, yes. After all, light can travel across the entire finite universe. I wonder how our donut-shaped universe looks from the side. 
presumably situated with others. A person always strives to overcome distances and the unknown. For thousands of years, geographical discoveries have been made at the limit of the capabilities of man himself, his willpower, health, endurance, as well as his transport. Eventually, the time will come to conquer space and the nearest stars. How difficult will it be to get to the nearest star system and hover over the galaxy in distant outer space? What difficulties our future interstellar travelers will be able to face? What makes long-distance travel so difficult or in some ways even impossible? Let's try to figure it out. Time. It takes too much to get even to the nearest stars. The Alpha Centauri system is only about 4 years old, if you travel at the speed of light, of course. But at slower speeds, it's still pretty far away. The stars of navigation of automatic devices, oddly enough, seems to some almost a solved problem. And this despite the fact that it is of little use to launch vehicles to the stars with the current turtle speeds and other primitive equipment on roads unknown to us. If the Voyager 2 spacecraft had headed for Alpha Centauri, it would not have reached it for another 75,000 years. Voyager 1 and Pioneer spacecraft are also moving outside the solar system now. For example, Pioneer 10 is heading towards the star Aldebaran. If nothing happens to it, the space snail will reach the vicinity of this star in 2 million years. In the same way, other apparatuses crawl across the expanses of the universe. So, regardless of whether the ship is habitable or not, it needs a high speed, close to the speed of light, to fly to the stars. However, this will help solve the problem of flying only to the closest stars. Well, even if we manage to build a starship using thermonuclear technologies, an ion engine, an antimatter engine, or we could invent lasers to push a spaceship equipped with sails, and our spaceship could fly at a speed close to the speed of light, then we would face another great difficulty. Accelerating a spaceship with clean energy will require a lot of thrust, not to mention that you will eventually run into a speed limit. According to the physics outlined in the general theory of relativity, when an object approaches the speed of light, its mass reaches infinity. In other words, a spaceship cannot physically move at the speed of light. But imagine a hypothetical and galactic photon ship capable of flying at a speed close to the speed of light. The proper time of the traveler's flight back and forth at a distance of about half the diameter of the galaxy with an optimal flight schedule, continuous acceleration and then continuous deceleration will be 42 years. On Earth, however, about a hundred thousand years will pass. And this is another difficulty that awaits our travelers, the time difference. And regardless of whether travelers travel at the speed of light or near the speed of light, or even use wormholes to move through space, they will inevitably encounter the phenomenon of time dilation. As the spacecraft moves at speeds approaching the speed of light, its passengers will age more slowly than their friends and relatives at home, even with makeup. This is what Einstein's special theory of relativity tells us. Thus, people on a long journey can return and find their loved ones very old or not at all. Yes, the passage of time in two systems moving relative to each other is different, since at long distances the ship will have time to develop a speed very close to the speed of light, the time difference on Earth and on the ship will be especially great. It is assumed that the first target of interstellar flights will be the already mentioned Alpha Centauri. At the speed of light, you can fly there in four and a half years. About ten years will pass on Earth during this time. 
But the greater the distance, the greater the time difference. According to some calculations, the journey may take more than 60 years, and a whole era will pass on Earth. How will their distant descendants meet the space Neanderthals? Perhaps with pitchforks and fire? Big question, and will the Earth be alive at all? That is, the return may be meaningless in principle. However, like the flight itself, perhaps. After all, we need to take into account that we see the same galaxy, the Andromeda Nebula as it was two and a half million years ago, so much goes to us and its light. Then what's the point of flying to an unknown destination that may not exist for a long time? In any case, in the same form and in the old place. But even if this does not stop us, then we are waiting for another difficulty or even an unknown anomaly. The Pioneer 10 spacecraft, having barely looked beyond the solar system, began to experience a force of unknown origin, causing weak braking. Many assumptions have been made, up to the unknown effects of inertia or even time. There is still no unambiguous explanation for this phenomenon. A variety of hypotheses are considered. From simple technical ones, for example, the reactive force from a gas leak in the apparatus to the introduction of new physical laws. Another spacecraft, Voyager 1, recorded a region with a strong magnetic field on the border of the solar system, in which the pressure of charged particles from interstellar space causes the bullet created by the sun to condense. The device also registered an increase in the number of high-energy electrons by about a hundred times, which penetrates into the solar system from interstellar space. And this is just a drop in the cosmic sea. After all, we are just beginning to take timid steps in the exploration of space. And what else we may encounter in the interstellar ocean, we can only guess. But we know for sure that another inevitable difficulty will await us, a dangerous flow of gas and dust, because the space between the stars is not empty. When a starship moves at a speed close to the speed of light, all these particles create a stream of high energy that will affect the ship. Every atom that collides with a spaceship will be like a particle of cosmic rays of high energy. Galactic gas consists mainly of hydrogen. Taking into account its mass and concentration, a powerful stream with the energy of each particle of the order of 500 mega electron volts will be created. The impact of these flows may lead to the evaporation of any protective shield and unacceptably high radiation dose rates for a long flight, which are disastrous for interstellar travelers. In 1906, an interesting experiment was conducted at a village fair in the city of Plymouth, 
Great Britain. Francis Galton, as an entertainment for visitors to the fair, assessed the weight of the bull on public display by eye and, without voicing, write this figure on paper. The organizers of the show promised prizes for correct answers, perhaps some part of the bull. As a result, about 800 people took part in the voting. Having collected all the answers for analysis after this fair, Galton calculated the arithmetic mean, and it amounted to 542 kilograms 900 grams in reality, the weight of the bull turned out to be equal to 543 kilograms 400 grams in some incomprehensible way, a motley audience gave an answer as close as possible to the real indicator. That is, the public's response was more accurate than the response of a single expert, for example, some butcher or cattle breeder. Galton, who had previously believed in breeding and the superiority of some people over others, was forced to change the vector of his research. As it turned out, under certain conditions, the intelligence of a large group of people is much more accurate and reliable than the specialized knowledge of any person in it. This phenomenon has been replicated many times in different fields. This concept, by the way, is far from new. Even Aristotle in the 350th year BC wrote, it is possible that many people, even individually, are not good people, but when they come together, they can be better. Not individually, but collectively. Just like public dinners, to which many contribute, are better than if delivered at the expense of one person. That is, one head is good, but two are better. Well, for that matter, three heads are even better than two, and four even more so. In the presence of hundreds or thousands, reason is simply bound to prevail. What makes a crowd reasonable? Collective intelligence is based on two factors, diversity and independence. Sometimes a group of people consisting of representatives of different professions, ages, nationalities is smarter than a crowd consisting of the same people. Different people pay attention to different details, and if they are properly combined, the collective knowledge will be more extensive and detailed than the knowledge of any individual. Yes, collective intelligence or intelligence is a concept introduced in the 1980s in sociology when studying the process of collective decision-making. By the way, collective intelligence is inherent in many animals, insects, and bacteria. There is even such a thing as microbial intelligence, a concept that considers certain aspects of the behavior of microorganisms as intelligence. Complex adaptive behavior manifested by individual cells, as well as cooperative behavior in populations of similar or dissimilar cells. In simple words, various protozoan microorganisms or algae demonstrate remarkable abilities for self-organization in changing circumstances. But also many more complex organized creatures live in colonies, swarms, or even form temporary clusters that seem to have independent intelligence, slightly exceeding the capabilities of individual individuals. Although we perceive colonies as an entity consisting of individuals, each of which has its own interests and its own thinking abilities, it is important not to forget that our body, like the body of every animal on the planet, is the products of a number of cooperative associations that have arisen under the pressure of circumstances. Developing this analogy, it is quite possible to assume that a single superintelligent organism can develop as a result of the unification of many intelligent organisms connected to each other so closely that they can no longer be considered separate individuals. And here we come to the most interesting. It's about the universe. Can we see at least some hints of some kind of superintelligence in outer space? Previously, it was assumed that stars, galaxies and any other cosmic substance are located in space in an irregular way. The researchers came to the conclusion that this is not the case. According to one theory, matter in the universe is not located randomly, but is formed into structural cells of the order of 100 to 300 million light years. An interesting pattern was found. Galaxies and their clusters are located along the walls of huge spatial honeycombs, and the closer to the joints of such cells, the stronger the concentrated matter. 
A more thorough analysis of this discovery confirmed the cellular structure of the universe. The essence of the structure is that almost all galaxies are located in walls forming hexagonal honeycombs. Let's hope we won't see any galactic bees there. So inside the cells themselves there are no galaxies at all, but there are giant voids in which there is practically no matter familiar to us, but even such rarefied matter as interstellar and intergalactic gas. Unfortunately, it is impossible to explain the pure structure of the universe on the basis of the physical laws known to us. But even by chance, such a structure could hardly have been formed. And if so, then we need to look for the force that caused the cluster of galaxies to cluster in this way. It should be noted that hexagonal energy structures are not the prerogative of the big cosmos. They permeate many macro and microstructures of space. Hexagonal structures are often found in nature. Basalt pillars from the eruption of an old volcano, snowflakes, beehives, the structure of dragonfly eyes, corals, crystals and many other structures, both biological and non-biological, have the shape of a hexagon. If we also talk about non-biological ones, then we can recall the foam from bubbles and even the famous huge hexagonal storm shapes on Saturn. Why are hexagons so common in nature? It depends on how you look at it. This can be an effective way to conserve mass and energy, or just a way to arrange the atoms in such a way that they are stable. It can be just something caused by geometry, and also boils down to the existence of a kind of superbrain in nature and the universe. This brain has created a stable hexagonal energy structure of hyperfine space, where everything is governed by the harmonious laws of the universe. According to the currently established concepts, the whole variety of physical phenomena is reduced to four main interactions, gravitational, electromagnetic and nuclear, weak and strong. All physical phenomena in our universe are described by equations containing fundamental constants. Among them are the speed of light, which sets the pace of the fastest processes, the constant, which determines the scale of quantum phenomena, the gravitational constant, as well as the masses, charges and other parameters of elementary particles. And what if we change the strength of fundamental interactions? For example, to increase a little the nuclear interaction binding protons and neutrons. This will make a stable atomic nucleus consisting of two protons without neutrons, the so-called diproton or helium-2. Calculations show that in this state all protons are combined into pairs and there will be no hydrogen left in the universe, so there will be no life. And if gravity is increased only a few times, then the stars, shrinking, will burn out tens of thousands of times faster, leaving no time for the development and maintenance of intelligent life. Just touch the weak interaction that determines the behavior of neutrinos, and supernovae will stop exploding, which scatter heavy elements synthesized in stars in space, and we will lose the planet. It turned out that in the laws of physics, literally nothing can be touched without the risk of getting a world devoid of observers. This strange fact became known as the fine-tuning of our universe. But let's return to the spatial honeycombs, since it is possible that they should somehow be connected with the mind of our universe and its fine-tuning. According to one theory, it is assumed that the matter filling the voids is supersparse and super-energetic, has unusual unknown properties. It can be for our universe the same cosmic cosmic supermind that existed in it initially. Thus, even at the moment of its birth, our universe was alive and intelligent. Cosmic life and archically does not descend from the mysterious matter of the voids of the intergalactic medium to the nuclei of galaxies and plasma magnetic structures, then interstellar space, to the stars and, finally, to the planets. Intelligent cosmic life creates according to its own pattern. What role does a person play in all this? If we go a little deeper into thinking, since science is powerless in this matter so far, then according to cosmopsychism, 
the position that the universe as a whole has consciousness, man and other conscious beings are aspects of this more fundamental supermind. It is often believed that the universe as a whole is the most fundamental object, and all its various parts, stars, worlds, and us, are in some sense derived from this more fundamental whole. Will a person ever be able to develop his own brain abilities enough to understand the universe, to be a part of this consciousness? Technological progress, the search for a unified theory of everything, most likely, we still have a long way to go to truly understand the collective mind on such a huge scale as our universe.